Good evening and a very warm welcome to all parents watching this video. Experiential learning, learning by doing, or project-based learning are not alien terms for parents today. We all understand and appreciate the power of learning by doing. However, is it always possible? We at Schoolvisor come across thousands of parents who have a range of questions when it comes to experiential learning. While the parent set varies, the set of questions they ask are similar. So for today's session, I'm gonna keep it simple. I will state the most discussed EL beliefs or questions that come to Schoolvisor from parents, and we get some experts from the industry to validate these and share their views. My name is Pooja Kedia and I'm from Schoolvisor. And since we're talking about experiential learning, we decided we will invite two veteran experiential learning educators from the school that pioneered experiential learning in Gurgaon. The first person that we have with us today has been raised between the backdrops of two cultures, British and Indian. Her educational philosophy has been sculpted through 26 years of educational leadership across a variety of contexts and countries from UK, Taiwan, India, and China, and in globally recognized prestigious international schools. She is Daisy Rana, head of school at Heritage International Experiential School. A continuous cycle of learning, reflection, and growth has been Daisy's mantra as she seeks to deliberately build today the next generation of learners, problem solvers, collaborators, and humanitarians ready to serve a more compassionate world for tomorrow. Welcome, Daisy. We are glad you could take the time out to talk to us today. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. Lovely. We also have with us Prerna Sridhar Manan, who is the head of middle school at Heritage and believes that a true teacher is actually a facilitator who creates a learning environment that is intellectually stimulating and a safe place where students take ownership of their own learning. She has continuously worked towards designing and executing multidisciplinary learning expeditions and believes in igniting students' interest in socially relevant issues to help them become active citizens. She has a postgraduate degree in sociology from the Delhi School of Economics and is trained in the field of expeditory learning. She has been a facilitator for Experiential Educators Conclave, an annual event organized by the Center of Experiential Education. Welcome, Prerna, and thanks for being here to talk to us today. Thank you so much, Pooja. Lovely. To start the session today, I would like to establish a clear understanding for all the parents watching this video of the three most talked about terms in this space, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, and experiential learning. Daisy, if I could, I'd like to um, ask you my first question. Are experiential learning, project-based learning, and um, inquiry-based learning piece of the same pod, or are they very different? Um, that's an interesting question to start with, so thank you for that. I would say that they are not exactly the same. However, they are very closely related to each other. So inquiry-based learning may be seen as a way in which to drive project-based learning. Um, Project-based learning really has inquiry at the center of it and front and center with a, a driving question or an inquiry-based question. But there is also a link to experiential learning too. So project-based learning can sometimes be thought of as a way of achieving um, experiential learning as one approach to achieve that. I wouldn't say that they are independent by any means. There is a lot of overlap, but I would say that one actually allows the other to happen. Uh, Pooja, you need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, no matter how much uh, you know we, we've been using Zoom, I think that's one uh, thing that always happens with me in all meetings. So apologies for that. Um, thank you so much for that, Daisy. I think uh, very clearly explained. So uh, yes, uh, there are interdependencies that clearly exist. Having said that, they do have a different um, um, a different focus. If I were to say so, what you said was that IBL drives PDL, which is inquiry-based learning drives project-based learning, and project-based learning tends to is achieved by experiential learning. 
So thank you. Um, on that, I will start off now with the, with the questions that um, typically come up. My first question, um, and Prina, if I could get your thoughts on this one, is that parents often ask us if experiential learning acts as a hindrance to cover a wide curriculum, obviously because it is time consuming for, for children to actually get into an experience and then talk about it, analyze it, come back and review it. That entire process is fairly time consuming. How does curriculum actually get covered, especially when the curriculum is wide in experiential learning? Thanks, Pooja. This is a very common question that we get from parents even now. Um, see, experiential learning, one has to understand, is meant for deeper learning to happen. And if deeper learning has to happen, then uh, obviously it will take more time. The students will reflect and there will be an entire process, the journey that the students will have to take through um, the experiential learning uh, design units. Uh, one thing that educators, I think, and I keep saying that to all my parents also, have to decide is about the difference between what is good to know and need to know within the curriculum. And with that thought in mind, when experiential learning units are designed, then the whole idea is to be able to ensure that we get deeper into the concepts. And once the understanding is built, the skills are developed, then it leads to, uh, you know, the child learns how to learn. And that helps in uh, achieving the curriculum uh, the way the school has decided. So it's not restrictive. I wouldn't call it it is restrictive at all. In fact, it's more expansive in nature in terms of the depth that it offers. And, and that is, I think, where the fears come in. So because it is expansive, because every concept takes longer, because it's more hands-on, children need to go through a process to be able to understand or grasp uh, things. And even if you're talking about, let's say, you know, let's say the need to know things, obviously a topic that's, that's covered in a chalk and talk kind of environment could be delivered quicker than what it is done in experiential learning? Would you, would you tend to agree? Uh, so you will be able to do it. You can easily do that from textbooks also. Uh, and that's not the approach that experiential learning takes because you've got to be teaching skills alongside. And the skills are to be able to, uh, you know, skills of critical thinking, to be able to research, uh, look at multiple sources of data. All of that will not be available through those chapters of, um, say, for example, a concept is being done on uh, food. Uh, a typical book would have concepts on deficiency, deficiency diseases, um, components of food and things like that. Whereas an experiential learning unit uh, will cover all different facets, including uh, my relationship with my immediate natural surrounding. So right. will that textbook or that chapter be able to cover that? If not, then that learning is not going to be enduring. I will forget that the moment I move to the next one. So what is it that we define as learning is most important before taking on um, you know, the whole notion of uh, experiential learning? It's, uh, it's not meant for if you want to cover only syllabus. But having said that, uh, if you look at the entire cycle of experiential learning, because it encompasses not just the concrete experience, there is reflection and observation, there is conceptualization that takes place, and there is transfer of knowledge mm -hmm. in the new setting. That's what learning is all about. And if that's happening, then the content will get covered. And in that sense, it allows you to cover more than what the so-called prescribed curriculum gives you. Okay, that's beautifully explained. So what I hear you say is it's not just the content. The key really lies in the fact that the way the curriculum is designed, you cover a lot more than the content. And um, if, if I'm if I'm right, uh, you know, in commenting also that probably with time, so that that experience taking long is more more an initial stage. Once a child gets used to that process, um, the entire experience also tends to become quicker. So there is sufficient time for you to cover the prescribed CPSC curriculum. Absolutely, you get into the zone of the ways to go about transacting that curriculum inside the class. So there's a lot of self-assessment happening. There's a lot of critiquing happening. Children are used to doing multiple drafts of things. They're working towards excellence. It becomes a norm, uh, okay. which otherwise you will spend a lot of time doing in your other uh, you know, fragmented way of teaching. Lovely, thank you so much for that. Um, we often hear um, a lot of chatter, especially from parents who have transferable jobs, 
um, th their fear is that exposing a child to experiential learning may prevent the child from learning in a conventional classroom setup in another city. Now, Daisy, would you believe that exposing a child to experiential learning will prevent them from effectively being able to learn in a talk and talk environment? Not at all. I mean, I think there is a place for both. Um, and it's a bit, as, as Prima said, what do we need to know versus what do we want to know? Um, what do we wish to know? So I don't see them being a hindrance to each other. Um, I think a student who has been exposed to experiential learning may actually be a better learner and therefore will be able to pick up wherever they go. They'll be able to transfer and make links between deeper concepts. And if they move to a different context or to a different school, will then be able to see how their learning fits together. They're much better at connecting learning. Um, I'd also like to add as well that experiential learning allows a student to experience a range of emotions as they are going through that cycle of experiential learning. Those emotions, the metacognition, the self-regulation, actually hold the student in great stead if they are moving to a different environment, a different learning environment, where the, the style of learning is very different. They're able to use their emotional development in order to be able to adapt. So just in summary to what you said, I actually don't see them as being a hindrance to each other. There is a place for both of them. Um, I think it's, it's the skill of the teacher, the skill of the facilitator, the educator to be able to work out what is the most appropriate type of pedagogy for what I want to get across right now or what we are learning right now. So for example, I'm a science teacher. Um, there will be times when there may be a need for some uh, more direct teaching to begin with. Or there will be many times where we may throw students straight into the experimental field and say, right, so here is what you have. Here are the resources that you have. And what could be the questions that you have that will allow you to have a deeper sense of inquiry? Um, so again, it's, it's about which is the type of approach that is most appropriate at that time. But I wouldn't say that they are uh, a hindrance to a student who's moving from one type of learning to other, another. They may find that there is a little bit of a disjoint. They may think this is strange. This is, a, this is an unusual way of learning. Um, mm -hmm. But I think a student who has had experience in experiential learning will be able to self-regulate, look at their own emotions and be able to adapt much quicker and possibly to actually challenge the rest of the class with some really deep inquiry questions that they are far more used to thinking through. Um, whereas the rest of the class may, may learn a little more passively uh, where they are expecting knowledge or content to be covered um, as opposed to experiences to be felt and discovered and, uh, and worked through and, and all of the kind of social, emotional and, and development things that come with it. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I like a lot of what you said, and I don't think uh, parents typically think like that. So the skills that they actually acquire during the experiences that they go through when they're doing experiential learning actually help a child adapt better. And that's, that's, uh, that's, that was quite beautifully put. The other thing to note here is for all the parents watching this video, it was clearly laid out by Daisy that these two methodologies do go hand in hand. Um, in a typical experiential learning environment, there will be topics that will be taught uh, in a lecture form where you're talking to the, to, the, to the child. But what you're encouraging them to do is to then be able to understand, analyze, reflect on what is being said, and not just look at the content and mug that up and you know come and give an exam. Yeah. So thank you so I much for that, Daisy. I just, I just want to add from there. So they'll be able to do all of the things that you have said, but they'll also then be able to think forward to, okay, so I have this information, I have this knowledge, what's the next step now? What action do I want to take? And uh, a student who maybe is not used to this style of learning might just stop at saying, I've gained the knowledge and the content. They may not think that further step into how is it applied? How is it transferred? Um, what's its use in society? So um, the, the, the next steps that the student takes in their thinking uh, are probably much more evident with students who have been through experiential learning. Um, they will see learning as a cycle and far more process driven. Um, as opposed to content or product product driven. Great, thank you. And I also like what you said about you know it's these kind of children that will come and challenge the class, and and that's that's very important in a classroom setup for somebody to be able to challenge status quo and say you know this is simple. What about this? Or have you thought about this? So thank you for that. Um, we're all aware that. 
typically in a traditional method, um, we laser focused on helping the child was gearing up for examinations. That, that's the, the big thing that you're preparing the child for. Um, another question, and I think a relevant question that comes from worried parents uh, when, you know, when they come to school visor, is that uh, you know, all this is great, but how does experiential learning actually prepare the child for examinations? Is there a space or a place uh, for things like mock tech tests and tips and tricks on how to ace an exam? Um, Prerna, if I could get uh, you to weigh in on that, please. Sure, Pooja. Um, you know, one thing again, again, a clarification uh, is that we're used to looking at curriculum and assessment as separate. Uh, so a learning is never complete if the assessment is not interwoven. And uh, when we talk about experiential learning, we're not just talking about students outside in the field all the time. So, uh, you know, we've got to get over this notion of experiential means uh, a lot with hands-on uh, and there is no cognitive uh, work going on. Uh, assessments are, a, are an integral part of the experiential learning uh, what do you say, framework that you pick, whether it is project-based learning or expeditions as we do at Heritage. Uh, the assessments are an everyday part of their learning journey, which means they're learning to see where they are in their, uh, you know, whether they're close to the learning goal or not. Uh, they are used to looking at uh, checklists and rubrics to be able to see what the success criteria is going to be. Uh, they're not just working uh, towards a goal blindly. Uh, it's not just the teacher's feedback that they're waiting for. There is a lot of peer critique and self-assessment that happens through the way. Now, these are techniques that will help um, the student to be able to write any kind of exam, not just you know, the, the state uh, boards or any such high-stake exams, but any exams and assessments. So it, it's, again, it's the... It's a skill to be able to take those exams. Now, as far as writing exam in a stipulated time and uh, those skills are concerned, those don't take time. And they're part and parcel of the everyday learning. It's the resilience that you build. It's the, you know, uh, the skill of being able to rework on the work that you've done to be able to see whether it is up to the mark or not. If all of that is being built, then those are the skills that you require even for uh, any learning or any exam situation. Great, thank you. Uh, what I also hear you say is that this is kind of routine with experiential learning. In a way, would it be true that you're kind of taking the exam fear actually out of the equation? So the child really sits like an exam uh, as if it's a daily thing for them to do, like, you know, sit down and take a quiz or an assessment you know, to decide where you are so that you can reflect on your performance and then improve it. Oh, yes. And in fact, uh, they know that this is this demonstration of understanding is going to be a part of uh, any time the concept is nearing its completion and uh, even in between. And various different forms are also, um, you know, expected from students to be able to uh, demonstrate their understanding. So it's part of their everyday learning. Uh, they don't look at it as an exam and, a, uh, you know, a learning separate. So that, that okay. doesn't happen. Yeah, it's, it's okay. more interesting. Thank you for breaking that down for our parents. That makes complete sense. Um, and I think the other thing that I hear you say is that with uh, education or with, with experiential learning, sorry, um, it's not just the ability to know the answer, but the ability to find the correct solution that is um, promoted. And I think that is a skill that goes a long way in defining the child's future. So, so also, yeah, thank another you thing, Pooja, are there also because they're looking at everything is connected to the real life context. So right. when they're actually, uh, you know, say for example, preparing a, a, a questionnaire for a particular audience in society, then mm -hmm. they're also looking at the skill of designing the right kind of questions to ask. So the comprehension is always being worked upon. So these students are very quick with the kind yeah. of questions and the complexities that are offered at the right. examination level also. Right, lovely. Great, thank you so much for adding that on. Um, uh, Daisy, the next one is for you. Our parents often wonder if a child who's already thriving in a chalk and talk environment, doing extremely well, understands what's happening, is ahead of the game when it comes to all the other students, would you recommend an experiential learning environment for them? And if the answer to that is a yes, why? So um, the answer for me is resoundingly yes. Um, I would recommend an experiential learning environment for them. 
not to let go completely of the chalk and talk approach. Chalk, chalk and talk, chalk kind of hurts my soul a little bit because uh, it is something that we tend to use a long time ago. But I think a very much teacher driven approach. We're now moving far away from that. Education has come much, much uh, further away from that now. Um, so I think parents need to think about what they value. Are they valuing exam success? Uh, which basically means being able to regurgitate the syllabus uh, and the textbook. That's how it used to be. Or are they looking at their child being able to inquire? And as Prenna said, being able to ask the right questions. So I wouldn't say that parents should be certainly afraid of, of chalk and talk, but certainly they should expose the child to experiential learning because it's a way of actually reinforcing what some of the chalk and talk might have said. Um, it gives them an idea of how to pin their knowledge in the right direction, how to deepen that knowledge, how to uh, use that knowledge in a different kind of context, and then to create new knowledge. Because it's not just about regurgitating knowledge and, and things that have already been done. It's actually about using what you may have around you, using maybe some of the chalk and talk, but questioning it and saying, well, what if I change this? And what if I change that? And how would that lead to a new result? Mm -hmm. So as a, as, a, as a society, as a world, we don't need to learn what we, we don't need to know what we already know. We, we need to find new solutions to many problems that the world is facing. We're not going to get that by using the same kind of learning that we have for the last, you know, hundreds of years. We now need a very different approach, um, a much more, an approach that maybe embraces risk and embraces the unknown. Um, and parents, I think these days are becoming much more savvy at um, understanding that and understanding that exam success, it will come if the right conditions are created to allow the child to be able to flourish in different environments. And sometimes that environment may be a very teacher-driven kind of presentation mode, but actually the most important part is what that child does with that information and how they use it to create new understanding. Um, I won't talk too much further about this, but um, I'm thinking about my own experience as a science teacher and how to begin with, uh, many, many decades ago, we would give students the experiment and say, follow this. Um, and they would follow step by step and come out with a, with, a, with a solution or come out with a result that we already knew they would get. So what is the point? Um, and I remember one student actually in a debate standing up and saying, but you knew that was the answer. So why, why are we doing that again? We're just regurgitating what's there. Instead, what we should be doing is allowing students to take the understanding we have given them and to take it in different directions, uh, to innovate, to be creative with their thinking and to think, well, if I change that variable and if I change that environment, what would happen then? I might find out something new that nobody has. And that's really the direction that, that I hope that a lot of parents are hoping we will go in and we are going in. Um, and not the traditional style of learning, which just gets you the same results as you had before. Um, just, just coming back to what your previous question is, it's, it's absolutely possible to have exam success and parent confidence through using okay. experiential learning. So the two are not independent, they rely on each other. Um, I don't see them as being harmful to each other. In fact, they should amplify each other. Great, thank you so much for that, Daisy. I think you have explained it in a very clear way. And I love what you said about um, the two being um, kind of going hand in hand. I think that's where our parents typically get confused. When they look at a experiential learning environment, they fail to see um, that it is actually both the chalk and talk and experiential learning that go hand in hand. Um, the, the idea is that the, that the curriculum is designed in a way that the child goes through various phases of not just learning the content, but developing skills and understanding a lot more that goes around in terms of what would happen, what if, uh, and asking questions and trying to you know, understand experiences related to that topic, um, which actually build a holistic understanding of whatever is being taught. Um, and that obviously means better exam results because there's better understanding and the outcome, which is, you know, their, their quizzes and their exam results will reflect that. 
So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I also like what you said about, uh, you know, the fact that there is a fair amount of um, a, a challenge that is built in a class where there's experiential learning. So there's, uh, you know, the, the example that you gave of your own growing up years, I think that was beautiful. Why go ahead and do an experiment when you know what the outcome is? So I think that kind of ups the level of what's, what's happening in a classroom environment. So thank you for that. Um, I'll move on um, uh, now to you, Prerna. Um, one of the things that um, we all believe is that um, experiential learning is self-paced. Firstly, I'd want you to verify if that's true or no. If yes, it is self-paced, how does self-paced learning actually take place in an environment of succession where there's one batch that then needs to move on to the next batch and there's obviously you know, limitations that you're working with? Um, and on the contrary, if you think, no, experiential learning is not self-paced, how does an educator ensure that every child in the classroom, or at least majority of the children in the classroom, have an opportunity to learn through their experiences, uh, when obviously there is a certain pace that needs to be maintained? So my answer to this would be, uh, there is no black and white answer for it. It's not, it okay. is self-paced to a certain extent. But okay. it is also transacted through a framework where there is opportunity available for students to be able to absorb and every child will absorb the experience based on uh, his or her own uh, level of understanding. Uh, there, are, there is also choice and voice built in to the entire design of experiential learning. So that also kind of gives them uh, uh, their own pace of you know, um, uh, making sense of whatever they're learning. Uh, Having said that, there is a lot of scaffolding that takes place. So I want this uh, myth uh, to break that experiential learning is loosely held where every child can move in whichever direction they feel like. It's not, it requires a whole lot of planning um, from the teacher's end. Uh, and so that the teacher, when she's actually transacting the plan in the class is more like a facilitator. There, every child, gets to feel that they are the ones who are constructing that knowledge. Uh, they are the ones who are transforming the experience for themselves and for uh, you know, outside. So the connection they build with outside, all of those experiences, the scaffolding that takes place, the learning, the, uh, and it, scaffolding also takes place through talk and talk. It's not as if you know, it's not happening with uh, the conventional way of lecture method also in class. Sometimes those are the best ways to be able to um, you know, assimilate whatever the learning uh, has right. taken place. Um, so there is pace, uh, there is self, um, uh, what do you say, pace for every child to be able to learn and um, you know, uh, absorb what is going on, but it is not completely um, just let loose. So there is a, a time when the learning will happen and then there is a time when you have to uh, be able to transfer that into a new uh, surrounding or a new environment or a new question to solve the problem and then uh, there is choice to be able to pick and uh, choose the kind of product that you would like to create to be able to uh, address the solution that you're looking at. So in those terms some bit of self-paced but a lot of scaffolding um, so that students move at a certain level and they move from one concept to the other. Another very important part of experiential learning is the differentiated uh, instruction that happens while the class is on. Because the students are also at different levels, the experiences are built in such a manner that you know some students might be able to grapple with it while the others can really move fast with it. Uh, different ways of differentiated instructions uh, are easy to be able to um, plan in an experiential learning kind of a, a setup as compared to a conventional classroom where you have to move ahead with the concept one after another. Right. Um, so for all the parents, I think that was, that was put in very simple terms for everybody to understand. So there is freedom, uh, there is liberty, but it is bound by certain boundaries. There is scaffolding to make sure that no child actually falls, um, but they are still kind of, uh, you know, in, in a zone where there is uh, a sense of self-control and you know like like we we read in your introduction that you're somebody who likes to be a facilitator 
and wants the child to take the onus of their own learning. And that is essentially what experiential learning does, puts the child in charge of their own learning. So great, thank you so much for explaining that beautifully for us. Um, we've uh, come to the end of this discussion, but before, before we actually wrap, I would like to um, quickly get your thoughts. We've spoken about a few questions, a few myths that do the rounds in the parent cycle. Um, you know, as a closing thought, um, really quickly within, within a minute, if you could please state any other experiential learning myth other than the ones that we've discussed um, that you'd like to put to bed today, or if there's any other uh, fact which, which is underrated, uh, which you've come across in your experience that you'd like to talk about, um, I'd like to hear from you. And Daisy, if I could start with you, please. So, yeah, so, so this is more an observation. Um, and the observation is what happens when you uh, attempt and encourage students with experiential learning in different cultures. Um, so different cultures have very different approaches to learning. They have different relationships when it comes to um, self-driven learning. So there are some cultures, for example, the, the culture that I was in just before I moved to India, where the teacher was expected to know it all. And the teacher was expected to stand at the front and deliver the answers. And when that didn't happen, the students would feel they weren't learning. Um, Parents as well had a very different idea about what learning meant. So it's the teacher's role to actually expose the students to different types of learning and to show the students of, of different cultures that actually this is, um, this is a different type of learning. This is a much deeper type of learning. You are still learning. Whereas when I've worked in Europe, there is an expectation that you will have the chance to be free in your learning and autonomous. So again, I think it's a matter of um, the teacher adapting to the students that are there in the class and understanding that different cultures will accept experiential learning differently. Um, and that not everybody will embrace it to begin with, but the role of the facilitator and the educator is to expose and to be able to show that actually here is another way of learning, try it and let's see what happens. Um, I think that's something that needs to be unpicked uh, probably for another discussion about how education is viewed in different cultures and therefore how pedagogy is preferred um, by educators and therefore students in, from different cultures. There are different expectations and experiential learning may not fit in a nice neat box for, for some students and for some cultures, but for others, that's exactly what they want. So the teacher has to be able to kind of switch between the two. Right. Great. Thank you. And I think that also in a, in a big way would define the relationship between the teacher um, and the student. Um, and, and, and I can I could kind of imagine you know, as you were saying this, that there is there is a beautiful uh, equation that's created both you know, in primary years and in senior years. There is a different dynamic that this relationship would, would bring out. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Prina, over to you. So uh, uh, Daisy shared about the different cultures. I think another, uh, the myth, a very common one is that it's good for the early years. Uh, though it is important to start early, uh, but the more experiential it is in the senior grades, the more freedom we offer to the students to be able to exercise critical thinking. That's one. Um, the other is um, the different, the design principles around which experiential learning really works. Uh, are the most important uh, facets of learning when the students move out for you know, being successful in their college journey and for their future also. So to be able to collaborate and work as teams, to be able to really uh, leverage the opportunity to bring about a change in society, do I have that connect or not? So uh, simple things like a geography lesson can be taught uh, in the class with, uh, you know, say for example, domains of earth or uh, landforms and things like that. But what if we connect it to something like Aravalis and look at what is happening to Aravalis now and uh, what is it that I can do? So there are three things to it. One is of course, realize what the problem is. Uh, the other is to be able to look for a solution at whatever level at which I am. So whether it is recommending to the local authorities or uh, to be able to really go ahead and choose which is the authentic audience for whom I'm going to be creating a product, I'm going to be solving a problem. But that is extended learning. So experiential learning is extended learning. Uh, it is also, um, it is the need of the art. So, um, and students who've been through experiential learning are reflective citizens. 
and very confident individuals. Uh, and I think we need to repeat this again and again because they only learn because they reflect on their experience. And that's something we don't do as individuals very often. Right. And I 100% resonate with what you've just said. It's, uh, I think it is the need of the art for all of us to change, uh, you know, with the way the environment is changing. And uh, unfortunately, we're very, um, we, we're very comfortable sitting down in our offices and talking about how things need to change. But nobody really gets on the ground to make that change happen. And I think it's time that schools start talking about it, making kids realize, and like, like you know, you, you very act, uh, correctly said, uh, making sure that children of today become active citizens of tomorrow so that, that education needs to happen happens right now, that sensitive, uh, sensitive, bringing in that sensitivity needs to happen now. And for them to be able to actually see that they're making a difference and that counts uh, needs to happen now. So thank you, great. Um, that's been really, really insightful. I hope all the parents who are watching this video felt the same. Uh, we all understand that our children, as they go along the learning process, they will learn a zillion things and they will be tested all the way. But one of the biggest exams that they will sit for is life itself. So it is very important that why not children know the answers, they also know how to analyze what they've done. While they know how to score, they also know how to stop, reflect, and then be able to correct mistakes that were made in the past. While they know what is black and white, they also appre appreciate the fact that shades of gray do exist in the world. As long as you choose a school that helps your child experience the above, your child is in good hands. It has been truly a very interesting conversation for me. And I hope the same for both of you. Thank you so much once again, uh, Daisy. Thank you, Prerna, for taking the time out to talk to us and answer these questions for our parents and clear the myths and uh, the truths on experiential learning. Thank you, Pooja. Lovely questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you so Thank much. You. All right. You have a lovely evening, both of you. Thank you. Once